It's so good to be here among you today. Thank you for having me here. On election day 2016, remember that day? This was before election evening 2016. On that day of uncertainty, I decided to plant a garden to take control of something, anything, and beautify that little plot of earth behind the condo that my family and I had recently moved into. Feeling distressed about our culture, our nation, feeling despair about climate change, I would make this backyard not just beautiful, but an expression of my spiritual values. Now this was a small backyard, about the size of a typical like 1950s middle-class house's living room. And most of that little backyard was taken up by a patio, so I didn't have a lot of soil to work with. But I plotted ahead anyway. First, I brought out the beauty that was already there by weeding carefully and fertilizing the roses and the like. And then I purchased native plants so threatened in our area where new houses are swallowing sage-covered hills every day. I'm sure you can identify. I bought a house, a little house for solitary bees and mounted it on the fence and I planted some flowers that they would like. And with great expectancy, I bought some milkweed, envisioning generations of monarch butterflies birthed at our home. Now, all was going well with that little garden until I decided to plant a vegetable garden. First, it was the demise of the spinach taken down by mites. Then it was the kale devoured by aphids. And I started to apply organic pesticides, but then I realized I couldn't because even though they were organic, they would kill the monarch caterpillars too. So I bought some ladybugs to eat the insects off of the veggies, and then they flew away or they died. So I planted new kale and spinach, but then I noticed something else was coming in to eat them. Birds. So I built this whole ugly contraption to scare the birds away from the garden with old CDs and things like that. But then my garden wasn't very pretty anymore. And one day workers came to fix the patio and a nest of five rats ran out from underneath. <laughs> oh my, so they were the veggie eaters. Did I mention that we're a family of animal-loving vegans? <laughs> now we were vegans with a rat problem. I was already feeling like this little yard was putting my values at cross purposes, but then we got a dog. A dog who loves to dig and lie in dirt. She has trampled carefully nurtured native plants as well as the kale and the onions, and she has come very close to squishing precious monarchs. This yard, this expression of my spiritual values, <laughs> became an illustration of the interdependent web, but not in a pretty way. <laughs> it became a system at war with itself. Have you experienced that too? Feeling that despite your best efforts at good things, dysfunction reigns? Feeling like every intervention you make just causes new problems? Feeling like you're within a system that you just can't control? I certainly do. We Unitarian Universalists talk a lot about systems, about the justice system, the economic system, the systems that are out there, like solar systems, and the systems in here, the digestive systems, the social systems that we're caught up in. And unless you believe in an all-powerful God, you've probably come to recognize that no one and no thing is in charge of a system even that, those systems inside us, we can't control them. A system is really a community, a complex community of beings, each with its own behaviors and its own purposes. And like my backyard, the results of a system say more about it than the values and the efforts that went into it. It's not just good intentions or the thought that counts. 
I'm on the congregational life staff of the Unitarian Universalist Association. And this means that I support the living systems of our congregations in the Pacific Western region, partnering with you to tend to the health of your overall system. And our congregations, like my backyard, can sometimes find ourselves all tangled up. We face conundrums, like on the one hand, we value radical inclusion, and on the other hand, we value kindness and good boundaries. So then what does it mean when our radical, what does it mean to be radically inclusive of someone whose behavior occasionally becomes pretty darn hurtful and inappropriate? Those values can come into conflict in the life of a congregation. Or then there are times with our systems that we clean up our policies and procedures to try to control the loosey-goosiness, but then we find that everybody ignores them anyway and the loosey-goosiness persists. Or times when a congregation's bylaws say who's really in charge here, but the system knows it's really Sally and Joe who are in charge. In a complex human system like a congregation, there can be so many layers upon layers of values and culture and meaning and the way things, that always, have, the way things always have been done that it can feel pretty hard to change things. Even for someone in a position that we ask to make change, like a congregational president or a minister, a living system is naturally resistant to change. And the whole system needs to be taken into account if we're to transform a congregation, a backyard, or our world. This is a very, very challenging time to be a spiritually progressive person in the United States. So much anxiety and fear and hatred, so much violence, so much othering. It tears at our hearts. It is hard to know how to respond when every day there are more examples of cruelty, more examples of targeting people, scapegoating people, more examples of creeping autocracy, and more. This is not what we were supposed to be like, not how we were supposed to be as a country, as a world. And we are Unitarian Universalists because we believe in the human capacity for goodness, and yet we are seeing so much the human capacity for evil being played into. But at the same time, there is something else emerging. A new sense of our power as people. Several deeply interconnected, creative, and wise movements of people working together to not only challenge the evil, but working to make love win. We see it today with, with the members of this congregation who are in the desert, bringing water to migrants and standing with no more deaths. We, see, we saw it happen with families belong together, just coming out of nowhere, with Mehente rising up and challenging zero tolerance and calling for the abolition of ICE and faith communities like ours supporting that. We saw it with the students at, in the spring, we saw an amazing example of it with the students at Marjorie Stoneham Douglas High School where it became not just another school shooting, but something that took hold and galvanized millions. The emergence of love-based activism can surprise our nation. Why that time? Why those people? Why did it happen then? This is at the heart of what I want to share with you today. Beauty and power emerge in unexpected places when we've been tending to our living systems and planting the seeds and nurturing the roots for connection. The words of early 20th century activist minister Howard Thurman that were read so beautifully by Raven just before this sermon, his words call us to notice not just what's messed up in the system, he counsels us to look well to the growing edge all around us, worlds are dying and new worlds are being born, he writes. All around us, life is dying and life is being born. 
The fruit ripens on the tree. The roots are silently at work in the darkness of the earth against a time when there shall be new leaves, fresh blossoms, green fruit. All around us now, worlds are dying and worlds are being reborn. Howard Thurman wrote this in the last century, decades ago, and he didn't say this lightly. He grew up at the very first part of the 20th century. He was born in 1899. He was born as a black person in the segregated South, where he witnessed everyday legalized terror targeted against him. Just a generation before, his family was enslaved. But his family, his community, his church, the spirituals they sang and the Bible they read taught him something else too. His faith called him in the midst of the suffering and the horror of everyday life to look deeply at what was emerging, the growing edge, what life-giving possibilities are born at every moment. He did most of his work and his ministry in a time when there was no certainty at all that legal segregation would ever end. There was no proof that nonviolence could change the world. But all the while he was planting the seeds, nurturing the shoots, looking at the life-giving possibilities for equality and freedom. And without knowing it, Howard Thurman built relationships and made connections that in the 1950s blossomed into an unstoppable civil rights movement. So where is the growing edge in our living system? Those roots, those shoots, those seeds that will flourish in decades beyond our lifetimes or even now. Where is the growing edge in the living system that you are planting and tending at this congregation? Where is the growing edge in the living system that you are planting and tending in Albuquerque and New Mexico and beyond? What shoots are arising here? What roots are spreading underground? What happened? with the young people after the Florida shooting, what happened with the civil rights movement, that was something called emergence. The contemporary activist Adrian Marie Brown sees emergence as a key strategy for how we change the systems of our lives to be more loving and just. Her new book, Emergent Strategy, comes from her justice work and her studies of science fiction and activism um, with, with, pr that prioritizes queer and black lives. And she explains emergence this way. Emergence is the way complex systems and patterns arise out of a multiplicity of relatively simple interactions. There are examples of emergence everywhere. She continues, Emergence is beyond the, what the sum of its parts could even imagine. Oak trees don't set an intention to listen to each other better or agree to hold tight to each other when the next storm comes. Under the earth, always they reach for each other. They grow such that their roots are intertwined and create a system of strength that is as resilient on a sunny day as it is in a hurricane. She continues, dandelions don't know whether they are a weed or a brilliance, but each seed can create a field of dandelions. We are invited to be that prolific and to return fertility to the soil around us. And what emerges from these cycles are complex organisms, systems, movements, societies. Nothing is wasted or a failure. Emergence is a system that makes use of everything. I invite us to think of those oak trees. Under the earth, they reach for each other. They grow such that their roots are entwined. How are we reaching out for one another? How are we reaching for each other 
across those divides, even as politicians and cultural leaders try to sow cruelty and division? How are we reaching out and building connections instead? What sort of things might emerge if we but build the relationships and the connections? The connecting, the connecting, waking up to those ancestry DNA results that came in for all of us, that we are, each of us, deeply interdependent, deeply indebted to all people and all life, one family. Realizing that we are related to and in relationship with everyone and everything, feeling awe and wonder and love, love for this tremendous experience of life that we share, love for one another, love for those who are different from us, love for the creatures, the microorganisms, the earth, resisting with all of our might the forces that tell us that we are separate, that we are other. The systems thinker Donella Meadows tells us, the future can't be predicted, but it can be envisioned and brought lovingly into being. We can't surge forward with certainty into a world of no surprises, but we can expect surprises and learn from them and even profit from them. She continues, we can't impose our will on a system. We can listen to what the system tells us and discover how its properties and our values can work together to bring forth something much better than could ever be produced by our will alone. We can't control the systems or figure them out, but we can dance with them, she concludes. How will you dance with the living system that is First Unitarian of Albuquerque? How will you dance with the world? How will you dance in your own backyard? How will we listen and discover and bring into being something better and more beautiful than we could have imagined alone? My backyard is in the process of becoming. As a player in its system, I'm watching and learning from it. I'm noticing that the dog has helped the vegetables because the rats now stay away. I'm witnessing the milkweed and paying attention to how I can help it regenerate after generations of monarch caterpillars gnaw the leaves away. On a recent sunny day, I sat back there with my spouse and my dog enjoying lunch, and suddenly a monarch burst into the yard in her glorious bright orange and flew straight to the milkweed. She hovered for a bit, but she wasn't just gathering nectar. I realized what she was doing. She was curling her body into a C shape to lay eggs. We watched as she fluttered from leaf to leaf, laying almost two dozen eggs. In the midst of this, we heard a buzz and turned to see an Anna's hummingbird sticking her bill up into an aloe flower, and then pausing to perch and give us a glimpse of her silvery tongue. A bee then came to visit my lunch plate landing on my broccoli, and I knew that the living system of this backyard had come truly alive in its own way. Even though parts of the system were still at war, native life was emerging. On this day and the days forward, may we keep participating, keep tending, keep dancing, keep building relationship, keep living into that living system. Through all of the ugliness, we have faith that beauty and life-giving powers may emerge. So may it be, and amen.